Barnett. Good morning. Welcome to the Contemporary Issues class. And we are going to have quite a good discussion and presentation today on the new book, recently new book, Oath and Honor by Liz Cheney, the former representative from Wyoming, who talked about the J6 insurrection and the committee that investigated it afterwards. So we thank Ron for preparing a great presentation today. But before we get started, uh, our usual announcements. Zoomers, please mute yourself on the lower left corner of your screen so we can keep the background noise down. Nice to have six or seven of you here and 48 or 50 in the room. What a turnout today. Thank you. And uh, we are recording this for future playback. There are several people who wanted to be here that couldn't this morning. And so um, we always record for future playback on YouTube. And other announcements. Uh, Norma wanted to, since it is St. Patrick's Day, is it today? St. Yes. Patrick's Day? That's, That's why right. everybody's wearing green. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> a coincidence. The church is having a uh, trip to Ireland and led by Rev. Amy, is that Rev. right? Amy. Uh, it's to Northern Ireland. It will be some sightseeing, but we'll focus on peace and justice and the troubles that yeah. happen. And then I think it's about nine or 10 days. It's $2,500. You can do your own air. Or they'll do air for you. Then they're going to add on, the company's going to add on some um, traveling in that is not Northern Ireland, as I understand it. So I don't know of how well this has been publicized, but if you want information, um, Rev. Amy's in Alaska, but she'll be back. You can email her and, and find out about it. That's fine. That'd be very good. Thank you. When is that? August. It's in August. August, this August. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, very good. Uh, anybody here actually Irish? Descendants from Irish? Bill is half Irish and Deb. And my goodness, that's quite a few. Well, the best luck of the Irish to you. Okay. Yes, Joy. If you got on green and go to Krispy Kreme, you could have a free donut. A free donut. <laughs> said a free donut at Krispy Kreme if you're wearing green. Okay. All right. We want to have plenty of time for Ron to present today and uh, for discussion also. Do you want to take comments on your presentation? Uh, a few brief comments. We're, okay. we're going to have time at the end Good. to uh, okay. Take, okay. take more. Also, we want to, I want to uh, comment for a moment about, of course, our topic today is political in nature, <laughs> not unusual for us, and it will be harsh on Mr. Trump. Uh, as, you, as you know, no surprise there, but we want to also acknowledge that in our class here, we uh, are harsh on, we hope, fair on both sides. And recently we talked about immigration and I made some comments about Mr. Biden has been uh, neglectful on immigration, in my opinion, and that we should acknowledge the good and the bad that are on both sides of the political aisle. But we also want to be fair and timely in our review of uh, political issues and books like this. So we're going to just lay it out as this lady laid it out in her book. And the, uh, I hope we as Christians that we pray for Mr. Trump and yeah. that recognize that God loves him as he does all people. And that uh, the things that Mr. Trump does and says that we don't agree with God can change his heart and help him to see. Are you going to read this? Us? All right. We well, I to... said the elephant in the room. The orange. <laughs> and I said the orange elephant in the room. <laughs> so we can have a sense of humor about it, too. Okay. With that, uh, if anybody doesn't know Ron Puning, our master presenter in class, retired engineer, 
reader of all topics and, <laughs> and master presenter. So thank you, Ron. A good for, soul. Good presentation and a good soul. That's okay. right. All righty. Well, I hope I don't have bloodshot eyes and throbbing veins in my forehead. <laughs> Under control. So with that, I must say it's one of the better books I've read. And I thought Liz did a superb job of keeping it factual. She, it, the book is loaded with factual, clear evidence, not uh, tirades uh, on, a, on a personal level. She kept it very factual. And let's, let's move into it. Some other materials. Uh, Cassidy Hutchinson, who uh, so courageously testified to the committee, has her book. And we'll mention her on a couple of the slides. And of course, we also did a lesson on Adam Kinzinger's book. He was the other Republican House member who uh, participated in the January 6th committee. By the way, that committee might not have happened. In fact, had the Democratic Party not had control of the House, uh, there may not have ever been a January 6th committee. It, no it, may not, it might not have happened which is scary in itself. Okay. Liz with her uh, her father, Dick Cheney, who was part of the uh, Republican presidential administration. And he is still, still alive and she has a very good relationship with her father. And next slide. Little cartoon everybody got to see. I like the one on the right. York is saying to his uh, dolphin friend, the herring's nothing. I'm going for the whole shamir. <laughs> yeah. The other one, we'll we'll skip for now to move on in the interest of time. Okay, again, some of the resources. I also recommend James Comey's book, A Higher Loyalty, which came out about two years ago. Uh, for those of you who watch PBS, uh, you want to make sure you watch The Story of Fascism in Europe by Rick Steves. And it shows how fascist or authoritarian regimes can rise and uh, come into power, how they did in Europe. And then the book that uh, Jim's got on his uh, desk in front of me, Romney, uh, that should arrive at my house on Monday. But Romney uh, has also been a, a Republican senator who has uh, been very courageous and outspoken in his uh, criticism. And another book I just finished, and I think you uh, looked at it, Strong Men, yes. by the professor there at uh, NYU, back mm -hmm. in New York City, from Mussolini to Trump. Uh -huh. Mussolini to Trump, called Strong Men. Yeah. Right. Yes, very powerful. Yeah. Okay, next one. All right. For those who uh, like frontline PBS presentations, there is a two hour and 15 minute uninterrupted program that captures pretty much the full essence of this book. Uh, I've watched it. I enjoyed it. Disturbing, but very actual, factual. And it's on Frontline. It's called Democracy on Trial. If you want to find it, just go onto your computer, type the two words, U-tube, U space tube, and then type in Democracy on Trial. It should come up. And uh, again, it does take a couple hours if you want to watch the fullness of it but it's well worth watching. I'm told it's also available on Amazon Prime Video. So a recommendation for that. All right, uh, a quote from Robert Kennedy, whether you like him or not, but I think this quote of his is very excellent. Every time we turn our heads the other way, when we see the law flatter, when we tolerate what we know to be wrong, when we close our eyes and ears to the corrupt because we are too busy or too frightened, when we fail to speak up and speak out, we strike a blow against freedom and decency and justice. He, of course, said that in the early 60s. It was true then and very true now. There's a little cartoon uh, showing uh, the orange guy with uh, some scared elephants in the corner of the room. And I think we're seeing a great bit of that right now. Next slide. Uh, John Adams, and of course, there was a PBS miniseries on John Adams, but uh, 
Adams had some very high virtues that I admire. And he, he made the statement, public virtue depends on private virtue. And he, he said, public passion must be superior to all private passions. Men must be ready, and women too, to sacrifice pleasures, passions, and interests, willing to sacrifice dearest friendships hmm. and connections when they stand in competition with the rights of society. So Adams very clearly said, democracy needs people who will stand up and pay the price, get their careers killed, get their persona torn down, are willing to make enemies, have people turn against them, but we need those kind of patriots who will stand up for what's right. John Meacham, whom uh, we've done a couple lessons on, his books, of course, on Thomas Jefferson and Abraham Lincoln. Uh, he praised Liz Cheney on, on TBS. Here he was being interviewed by Fox News and said he thought she was similar to Abraham Lincoln in terms of her courage wow. to speak out and flush her political career down the commode to stand up for what's right. Next one. All right, a few uh, pictures of uh, Liz. There she is participating with uh, the Democrat from Mississippi who led the January 6th committee hearings. There she is uh, with her, her, there's a picture of her husband and I believe her eldest daughter watching some of those hearings. Here she is on the, on the uh, lower left picture the day she received her law degree from the University of Chicago. And there she is in front of her log cabin uh, place in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, with her five children. So she's a mom. So amidst her political career, she obviously knows what it is to be a mother and uh, a wife. Next one. This is on the back cover of the book. Uh, the play Hamlet. There's a famous line out of Shakespeare's play that Hamlet, something's rotten in the state of Denmark. <laughs> I won't go into it, but this this phrase uh, that Liz put on the back cover of her book kind of catches that. Uh, she in essence said, in our country, we don't swear an oath to an individual or a political party. We take an oath to defend the Constitution, and that oath must mean something. Tonight, I say my Republican colleagues who are defending the indefensible. There will come a day when Don Trump is gone, but your dishonor will remain. This is on the back cover of her book. Next one. All right. One thing we want to mention about January 6th. January 6th was not a solitary event. It was the culmination event of a sequence. Just like if you were getting ready to rob a bank, you had somebody case the joint a few weeks in advance, where to put the getaway car, try to figure out whether the security guard would be in the lobby, uh, whether you could uh, block the street where the police were likely to come answering the alarm call. And clearly, as she points out in her book, the January 6th riot, or whatever you want to call it, uh, many, there's even plenty of folks in this church who don't think that was a riot. But... It was a culmination of a sequence of events. And as Jack Smith is presenting, uh, pulling his case together, he combined the whole sequence into a conspiracy and said, here's all the pieces. We're not going to try uh, Mr. Trump on one piece of this thing, but put the whole package together. It's the package plan that he uh, put together. Next one. <clears throat> We're going to start by saying the puppet master pulls the strings. Liz in indicates that two days after the 2020 election, she talked with uh, Kevin McCarthy. And Kevin said to her, he knows he, it's over, referring to Trump. He just needs time to process the loss. But then a few hours later, he was on TV and said, Trump won this election. Uh -huh. And in the handouts this morning on some of the desks, there's a book that just came out late this week, like the 14th. 
the day before the Ides of March. And that book is titled Disproven. And you've got a handout, a, a, a one or two page handout that is uh, an interview and some information on Ken Block. Donald Trump actually hired Ken Block, a strong Republican, to go investigate and try to come up with evidence of fraud. Ken Black, Block is an election security expert. He came back, having been hired by Don, Donald Trump, and told him, there's no fraud there. You lost, baby. And so the, if you want to read that, uh, and again, this book just came out, and it pretty much says, look, any way you look at this, if you investigate it, the people that have investigated have found that he lost by se about 7 million votes, and he lost the Electoral College fairly and honestly. Uh, go ahead, Jim. What really turned me off on Trump was in June of 2016, at a nighttime rally, he told the crowd that if he didn't win, the election was rigged and he wouldn't accept the results. That turned me off. And that's not an American talking, you know, that yeah. he wouldn't accept the results of the election. And I believe in a talk in Ohio that he gave yesterday, he said if he lost, there would be a bloodbath. Yeah. That's pretty scary. Yeah. So again, there's the book Disproven and Ken Block being inter interviewed. Uh, again, Block was uh, hired by Trump and you can be sure he had a, 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 a preliminary bias when he went into the investigation to try to give Trump the results he want, wanted, but uh, just didn't happen. Next one. Big lie bias. So we want to talk about the uh, the Red Mirage uh, rule. If you race a horse, if you go out down to a football field and you, you, you're you on the uh, goal line and they put the best race horse in the country ready to be in the Kentucky Derby and you have a race for 20 yards, you can beat that best race horse. But somewhere around the 20 yard line, that horse is going to overtake you and uh, beat you to the other side by a, a, a big margin. This is something we, we know happens in elections where Democrats often vote early and their precast ballots are counted just a little bit later. So we know what happened in 2020. Uh, they started counting votes in many of the states and uh, Trump went out ahead with the same day votes. But then as the big masses of precast votes started getting counting, counted that are heavily Democratic started coming in, uh, the racehorse took the lead and won by a substantial margin. So they call this the red mirage. And it's a well-known phenomena, which has occurred in just about every election in the last 30 years. Next one. Okay. The big lie. Uh, there's the hair dye that didn't come out as well as we would like. But uh, November 19, 2020, there was a press conference claim. And look at the number of states they claimed that there was uh, election fraud in. Georgia, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, Nevada, and Arizona. We have more than double the number of votes needed to overturn the election in terms of provable illegal ballots. Uh, Trump told uh, the Georgia uh, official, <laughs> Rothsberger, that he felt that there were over 5,000, or maybe more than that, illegal votes cast by dead people. And Rothsberger came back to him, who was an engineer by training, by the way, and said, you're wrong. We, we looked at it, and there were two. <laughs> Not 5,000. And then... Uh, all three of the lawyers who spoke at that press conference, Giuliani, Gina Ellis, and Sidney Powell, would later be sanctioned, censured, and indicted because of their lies about the election. Next one. From Jenna was from Colorado, wasn't she? All right. Also, uh, two days after the networks called the race for Biden, here was a shocker, and a scary shocker. Trump announced changes at the Pentagon unprecedented for a lame duck president. He announced he had fired his Secretary of Defense, Mark Esper, shown there, 
And Esper believed he was fired because he would not stand any use of the military to contest, contest the outcome of the election. So Trump was interested in having somebody in the Department of Defense go in there and have the military march in and, and uh, abscound and lock up voting machines or ballot boxes to get the U.S. military involved in uh, flipping the election. Uh, also, several inexperienced loyalists were appointed by Trump. Many were rejected by the Senate. Uh, there's, and there's detail. He tried to put in one guy named Doug McGregor, a retired colonel, who's known for spreading pro-Putin propaganda <laughs> into, the, uh, into the government agencies. So this is bad news when a president starts tries to get the military involved. Next one. Of course, in Latin America. Uh, there's a right-wing radio personality named Mark Levin, and he tweeted, he said, hey, all you Republican legislatures out there in the many states, you guys, all you got to do is call a, a meeting and just say, if the state didn't vote for Trump, we're just going to throw them out and put our uh, slate of electors in there. And since there are more state governments controlled by Republican legislatures than there are Democrats, uh, if this was possible, uh, that, that's pretty scary. But Levin is wrong. The state legislatures have the final say on how the electors are chosen. It was they set up the rules on how the state of Nebraska or Maine or Ohio is going to uh, choose their electors, and it's based on popular vote win, but they don't have the authority to, after the vote's over, to go in and say, well, we don't like the results, and we're going to just forget it. Colorado, you voted for uh, Biden, but we're going to throw it the other way. Of course, Colorado does not have a Republican-controlled state legislator. Uh, when Jim Jordan, by the way, of Ohio, had a turn to speak, he discussed, dismissed discussion of the legal processes and said, the only thing that counts is winning. <laughs> That's scary. Next one. It's like a football coach. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Rusty Bowers is a, is a lifelong uh, Republican living in Arizona. And in particular, this was covered by the frontline presentation. Yes. <clears throat> and he was visited, personally visited, by uh, Gina and Giuliani. And as soon as they met him, he said they said they had evidence of election fraud in Arizona. He was a top Arizona official. And when Rusty asked to see the evidence, Gina reached into a briefcase and said, oh, I must have left it in the hotel room. <laughs> And Giuliani, Giuliani then said, well, we have a lot of theories. We just don't have any evidence. <laughs> All right. That's right. So Rusty was kind of ticked off. Jim. I've been an election judge in Colorado a couple of times. And my observation is that in Colorado, the elections are conducted very fairly by both you know, Republicans and Democrats working together. So if you want to, you can probably be a, an election if you let the, the people in the county you know, know that you're willing to be a judge. All righty. In Cassidy Hutchinson's uh, testimony to the January 6th committee, she had a very powerful... Uh, well, they say. And he said... Uh, when she came in to uh, where Trump was eating a meal, she said you could see where he had thrown his lunch against the wall. Yeah. There was ketchup dripping down the wall. And she said this wasn't the first time he'd ever thrown a little hissy fit and thrown his lunch in the cafeteria like a, a elementary school. Yeah. Yeah, there's her quote. When I first noticed there was ketchup dripping down the wall, uh, reminds me of a song uh, from the early 60s, a little country tune. Counting flowers on the wall, that don't bother. We're going to watch and catch up on the wall. That don't bother me at all. <laughs> so 
that that's that's kind of scary to think you have an executive a chief executive that's going to throw his lunch against the junior high cafeteria wall and uh, th throw a hissy fit. So that's a good one. Uh, next one. There's also a quote by uh, Bill Barr. All right, something called an amicus brief, a Latin word. It's a way for people not directly involved in a case to express their support for one side or the other. Now, uh, Mike Johnson of Louisiana, who's now Speaker of the House, sent an email to the Republican members of the House with the line, the subject line, time-sensitive request from President Trump. It requested all the members of the House to sign on to this amicus brief, and he noted that Trump would pay close attention to who didn't sign. So it put some pressure on it. Johnson said the brief was to affirm serious concerns about the integrity of the election. And they got quite a few signatures. Uh, uh, Liz said that Mike Johnson misled the members. He pulled the bait and switch. The language of the amici asserted as facts many allegations of fraud and serious wrongdoings. So built into that brief were known lies and claims of fraud that simply weren't true. So she felt this was very shocking. And of course, she wouldn't think of signing such a thing. Nonetheless, 125 Republican members of the House signed on to that. And a Fox poll showed 77% of the Trump voters, 68% of the Republicans believed the election had been stolen. Next one. And of course, the Trump rally. Uh, here's some quotes taken from that rally, that speech. This is, of course, before the group marches over to the White House. Utilize the system to the very end. And then if it doesn't work, we will take our country back. This is Katrina Pearson speaking, the senior advisor. Uh, some speakers at that rally called Trump the anointed one. <laughs> and said, a group of wicked men has stolen our republic. And this is our 1776. One speaker quoted Thomas Jefferson. The tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants. And of course, Oath Keepers, Three Percenters, and Proud Boys were at the rally. Also, if you look at that pre-rally before they went over to the uh, White House, there were uh, metal detectors Capital. Capital. set up. Capital, Capital, not the White House. Capital, yeah. <laughs> that uh, metal detectors to go through, and a large part of the crowd did not go through. Uh, those those metal detectors to get in close at that pre pep rally. Next one. All righty. Uh, Jim Jordan, Josh Hawley, and Michael Flynn set the uh, stage to challenge the election in the legislature. You got to at least get you got to get it started with a senator supporting a, a challenge, and the first person to step up to do that was. Josh Hawley of uh, Missouri. So he stepped up and then several followed suit. We'll, sh we'll show on a another slide some of the others that followed uh, suit. Uh, also, there was a meeting with Donald Trump on December 21st, just four days before Christmas. And in, his, in attendance with Trump were Marjorie Greene, Jim Jordan, Mo Brooks, and Louis Gomer. And that's a pretty radical crowd when you get down to it. On the 22nd, Trump posted a video accusing the two black women in Georgia of serious personal uh, violations and law breaking and downright encouraged violence uh, against these women. Yeah. Their names being Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss. And you've probably seen them testify on TV of the uh, harassment, death threats, uh, late night knocks under door, drive-bys, they were severely harassed uh, because of their, they did nothing wrong. Absolutely nothing wrong. Next one. And again, the plan to get the army involved. Michael Flynn was interviewed on December 17th and was asked what the president's options might be. And he again said, Trump could immediately on his order seize every single one of these voting machines around the country, 
It could also order within the swing states, take military capabilities and place them, and it basically rerun the election in the states he wanted. So that's Michael Flynn. Uh, in response, the Secretary of the Army uh, reiterated what the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Mark Miley, said. There is no role for the U.S. military in determining the outcome of the American election. And of course, uh, Mark Miley has been threatened by Trump. Trump even said words like he ought to be hung, he's a traitor, uh, et cetera. So Ron, is that maybe what stopped Trump from going to that step of using the military was the military commanders would not go along with that? Part of it. We're going to get next slide. I'll go a little more of that. Uh, we'll we'll get to that in just a moment. Okay. The answer is yes. There was there was strong blow blowback and pushback against that. Uh, again, many in the Republican Freedom Caucus. That's a small group of uh, uh, Republicans in the House that are, I have to say, ultra conservative. One of their requirements to be in the Freedom Caucus is you if you join the Freedom Caucus, you must, if they vote like 80% for a certain thing, you agree that you will vote with them no matter what your personal thoughts are. So to join them, you've got to promise to vote the majority of the group, whatever your personal conviction Well, that's not freedom. <laughs> that's not a freedom caucus. That's coercive caucus. Yeah. Okay. Coercive caucus. <laughs> All right. Back, back up to that, that the one we were just on. Uh, and we want to point out that uh, Justice Scalia, who's not on the Supreme Court anymore, he passed away. That was replaced. He noted uh, way back in uh, twenty couple decades ago that he, he knows many nations had constitutions that look pretty darn good on paper. The Russian one, for example, isn't that bad if you look at it. It seems like, hey, this is maybe a democracy here. But he also pointed out that the constitution of a country will fail with, if the centralization of the power gets in the hands of one person that has too much power or one party that won't respect the processes and uh, can derail the Constitution and take it out of control. The last three appointments to the Supreme Court are liars. Prior, uh, in their Senate hearing, they said that the uh, Roe versus Wade was established law. And as soon as they were appointed to the court, they overturned it. Very true. So, you know, being a, lawyer, a liar is not a good qualification. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. For those who are following elections, uh, there's an election going on in Russia. It's been going on for, I think, a week or 10 days. And you got till midnight Russian Moscow time to get your ballot in. But we know what's going to happen. It's, it's a free election. So... Putin's going to go in and say, hey, I've, I've not only been elected, I've been elected by a landslide. But it's a, it's a demonstration of what can happen if one person or party gets a, an iron grip on power. And Maduro and Daniel Ortega. I didn't realize it was that long. <laughs> 24 years. Yeah, I, 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 I didn't know it was that long. Yeah. They don't have a presidential term. No. <laughs> yeah, this will be his fifth term. Five. <laughs> All right. I'd like to ask a question. How, how many people think that it would be good for the Supreme Court justice to have a term limit? Oh, yes. yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Dan? And everybody. That's, a, that's another hour discussion. <laughs> yes. Okay, next one. All right. Objecting to electors from disputed states. These are the senators listed in that first line who uh, said they would object to electors from disputed states because of unprecedented allegations of fraud and irregularities. And those guys were Ted Cruz of Texas, 
Marsha Blackburn of Tennessee, Braun of Indiana, Danes of Montana, uh, Ron Johnson, Wisconsin, John Kennedy of Louisiana, Langford of Oklahoma, plus the senators elect Haggerty of Tennessee, Loomis of Wyoming, and Marshall of Kansas and Tuberville of Alabama. Uh, Senator Cruz proposed a 10 day audit that would have violated both the Constitution and the Electoral Count. In other words, Ted Cruz said, that's, let's not vote on this certification that Mike Pence has, did uh, certify. Let's start a committee and do an investigation. Time delay, you know, if you could make this investigation go for ever and ever, Trump would never have to leave office. <laughs> so it's also been revealed that Trump associates assembled slates of false electors. <clears throat> <clears throat> flew them to Washington. Wow. All right. Uh, the Attorney General threat. Uh, Trump threatened to uh, fire Rosen, acting who was the acting eternal Attorney General. He's the gentleman on the right picture. And wanted to replace him with Jeffrey Clark, in the position of acting attorney. And uh, Clark, by the way, if you look at his credentials, is hardly qualified for that position. Uh, the rest of the Department of Justice senior leadership all said together they would resign if Clark took over from Rosen. So Trump was ready to do this. And the only thing that stopped him, they got the virtually the entire Department of Justice senior staff that said, if you do that, we're out of here. We're all quitting. And so, so he backed down, but it took pressure right to the, the goal line to uh, stop that from happening. Next one. Liz also uh, pulled together a public letter. They quickly contacted 10 former secretaries of the defense that were alive and living and in the area. And they all said, we all swore an oath to support and defend the Constitution in the United States. We did not swear to an individual or party. So here's these, this whole battery of uh, alumni, the uh, Department of Defense folks, and they all signed immediately, put a letter in there saying, don't you dare get the military invoked uh, to, to try to flip this election. Next one. Okay. The dueling slates of electors. Again, uh, Trump and his uh, team did put together with some letters, uh, assembled some false electors in several states, Wisconsin, Arizona, some other ones. Uh, Gina Ellis, with tears in her eyes there, she's pleading guilty, claimed on January 4th, seven states had dueling slates of electors. No, it just wasn't true. The fact was, each state had certified a single slate of electors. And so what else claimed would, was uh, at the, at the uh, backing of the Trump campaign, and she was flat out in lie and in, against the law. She reported there was clear evidence that the states had violated their own laws. There was no such evidence. And there he is in, in tears, pleading guilty for, for uh, these charges uh, to Georgia. There was also a threat that went out to Republican Congress members. Uh, Eric Trump went on TV January 5th, appeared on Sean Hannity's show and said, there would be consequences for any member who did not do what his father wanted, wanted threatening that any senator or congressman that does not fight tomorrow, their political career is over. And there was a certain amount of truth to that. Uh, Liz Cheney was overwhelmingly beat in Wyoming, by over 70% of the vote. Adam Kinziger, uh, I believe he, was, he resigned. He decided it was a hopeless case. Uh, there's a touch of humor though here. Uh, Liz said that uh, there was a little meeting going on uh, where they were signing this amicus brief, Republican, and there's a Republican Congress from, from Middle Tennessee named Mark Green, and he said to another guy, 
as people were in line to sign this a brief, the things we do for this orange Jesus. <laughs> so you can get yourself a t-shirt. What would OGA do? What would orange Jesus do? And so that's that name has now been coined on uh, Donald Trump, orange Jesus. Unfortunately for the Christian community, it's a, it's, a, it's a sad day when we have an orange Jesus. Next one. Okay. We could go into a lot of uh, discussion. We could have a whole uh, seminar on the January 6th riot. I call it a riot. And, and I think if you look at the, the film, there's innumerable evidences of violent uh, people doing things. Did every person that walked into that lab lobby do a violent act? No, but large numbers of them did. Things like installing that gallows outside uh, the halls of the what Capitol. Was Trump calling those ones that were imprisoned? Patriots. Patriots. Yeah. Hostages. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Uh, there were, as you remember, there were 16 resignations the day after Trump stood by and watched January 6th event go on. Uh, one of them was uh, uh, Mitch McConnell's wife, mm -hmm. Elaine Shaw, yeah. who was the secretary. transportation secretary. So there's a name of the uh, 16 instant resignations of people in the Trump cabinet that said yes, that even they- It's not well or, uh, publicized. No. It was not well publicized, he said. It wasn't. Ron, it's 11.15, yeah. just time check. Yeah, we just got two to go, so. <laughs> okay. Next one. Uh, Dan Scavino, Trump's former deputy attorney chief of staff said when he, uh, testified to the committee, said Trump, frankly, wasn't interested in stopping that riot. Uh, as the violence began to escalate, quote, Trump was just not interested in doing more to stop it. Next slide. We're going to conclude with these two. Uh, the famous Roman philosopher Marcus Aurelius, the path to moral excellence is not an easy one. It requires constant self-reflection, self-discipline, and the unwavering determination to choose righteousness over expediency. And then I like the picture on the right and the quote from Albert Einstein. The world will not be destroyed by those who do evil, but by those who watch them without doing anything. It's an Einstein quote. So he, he was smart in more than just nuclear physics. <laughs> All right. And then I, I passed out a... Uh, what I call a viewpoint lock-in sheet. Hopefully you have some of <laughs> You can lock in your viewpoint using these techniques. Number one, you can say, I don't care. I don't perceive this as important to my life. A lot of, we deal with a lot of issues in our, in our life this way. We just say, I don't care. Or as the Germans say, das macht nichts. Doesn't matter. Two, silence. I won't oppose virtually any crime or immoral action that increases the power or control of my tribe. In other words, and this, this is a high percentage of Americans and people in the world. Anything goes if it helps me. I don't care if there's injustice and whatever. Let it go. I think it's to my advantage. And then there's the inconvenient truth. When you argue with somebody's uh, conclusion, you can either attack their logic process, say, I don't like your logic process for you to come to this conclusion. In other words, you go out and say, there's the moon in the sky tonight, Steve, and we've got satellite data, we've landed on the moon, and my deductive reasoning says there's a moon uh, circling the earth. Uh, you can say, well, I don't like your logic process. Uh, it's It's... A doesn't follow from B. That's tough to fight. Uh, then the people that just throw out evidence, premises, or facts that counter their beliefs. Ignore the facts. Um, I, I think one of the uh, 
who's the Joel Osteen made the credible comment, uh, faith overcomes facts really? in one of his uh, sermons. Yeah. Which, yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and then there's those who say, I especially reject evidence or logic that does not originate from my authority figures. You know, it's, uh, I only believe stuff, either a logic process or facts that come from my approved uh, authority figures. Or to, sub to summarize it, I want to rationalize, not reason. I don't want to reason and come to a, uh, a fair uh, assessment. I want to come up with an argument that supports my conclusion that I have locked in. So I've yacked quite a bit here. So uh, some comments. How can we keep him from becoming president again? <laughs> you know, well, well, yeah. But the stuff that hits the news right now is pretty scary. You know, the control that they have. It's like, are people going to believe this? I mean, I just have to understand. He did say in Ohio yesterday, what was the comment he made about, was it him? Immigrants. What I heard was immigrants are not people. Yeah, some. And some. Some. Okay. Some. okay. Yeah, Red some immigrants are not people. <laughs> and if I don't win, there'll be a bloodbath. <laughs> and, and, and Sandra said, well, sure, Biden isn't the best candidate, but uh, not the best candidate. Uh, there's a, a lot of problems with him, but the alternative is even worse. <laughs> I would not want uh, Joe Biden to do a night landing of an aircraft on an aircraft carrier. <laughs> um, but if you look deep down and say, is there basic honesty and integrity there? Yes. Uh, can he do deep thinking? Uh, again, not a fighter pilot in a Top Gun confrontation. No, he's he, neither of those gentlemen is, is appropriate for that. But but yeah, he's got the deep thinking skills. Still. And he has the experience. Yeah. Grant on Zoom has a comment. Go ahead, Grant. Well, I have a question. Has there been any uh, study done as to how uh, President Obama in 2012 received 63 million votes and uh, Hillary Clinton in uh, 2016 received 65 million votes and how did biden uh end up with 81 million votes has there been any study done as to how that happened uh two two things number one the population the electoral population has grown every year for the last hundred years in the united states and two the participation rate zoomed higher uh, because of the intensity of passion about the candidates. Okay. One little comment too, uh, Grant, last year here at church, we had a uh, church breakfast where our speaker was the uh, president of the county clerk's council for Colorado. The county clerks uh, run the elections. And he explained to us how there are audits after every election, there are tight controls more than we would imagine uh, across the country by uh, county clerks and others checking the processes of the elections. And it's not well publicized, but there really is high confidence in the security and the results of the elections, more than we would think. Yes, there are some cases of fraud, but they're very small. And that showed up in the 64 uh, court cases that Trump brought to the courts and did not win a single one mm -hmm. showing any fraud in any of those yeah. cases. So there's high confidence in the American election system. And that's why Trump was not successful in showing any fraud yeah. of, well, the, of the high enough level to change <clears throat> any election results. Also, Trump's tremendous popularity in what I call very small town America showed up across the country. Very high numbers of Trump supporters showed up in little towns in Florida, Georgia, Pennsylvania, all over. 
uh, because of the enthusiasm that he has and still does generate. So the, the numbers of votes are very dependent upon the, uh, the intensity of the election. And this last one was incredibly intense. The draw drew out more votes on both sides. Zoomers, any more comments or questions from Zoomers? Please feel free to jump in here. <coughs> okay, thank you. Anybody else in the room? What do you think, yeah. Bill? So I, I know there's a ton of stuff, you know, with Liz and a lot of stuff has been written, but the reality is you've never been tried. We've never gone, we've no. never had a, a trial on this case. And so we're going to go into one of the likelihood. likelihood of not having a trial. And so, whoever said it is, you know, we do the only thing we have is to vote. I don't know that there'll be anything in terms of a trial that we'll have to use the judge. He's certainly not going to back down, which is an article I just read about LBJ who backed down and said, ah, I'm going to bail out, you know, at the last minute here and, you know, let somebody else take over. But there's no trial, there's nothing. And we're going to go into the assumption that. We're innocent until proven guilty. Mm -hmm. Gary. There's yeah. a lot of reports saying it wouldn't matter. The wow. cake has been baked. <laughs> so be it. But even if it goes to the Supreme Court, there's still nothing there to say to the American people. He's guilty and he could be removed. Nothing official. Nothing official. We can read these books. We can make all the assessments we want. And I think Don's point is, it won't matter if he's prosecuted to his base. Supporters will not matter because he's being persecuted as a victim by the, the deep Democrats. State. The yep. deep, the deep state. Yep. Yep. Other thoughts? We've got five minutes left. Lots of thoughts out there. Anybody? One thing that I think it's kind of interesting is that since this all came up in 2020, with the, the 2022 elections, for example, Republicans who lost, most of them did not say, election fraud, I lost, it must have been a fraudulent election. The integrity of the system has stayed together. Um, so even Trump's extreme uh, challenge to the system, it, that hasn't been modded by... There, most other Republicans. There are some Republicans that have gotten together. Fifty million dollars is being spent publishing what could be permission to lead the Republican Party by Republican voters saying, "I will not vote for Trump." Mm -hmm. Have you seen that on the news? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, a very powerful yeah. off ramp for yeah. people who are. Republicans hearing their own tribe say some of us are not going to vote for Trump. Also, it's a, it's an indictment of the turtle-like characteristics of the American legal system. I mean, even the guy that did the murder in Boulder, the King Supers there, how many years did it take before he oh, was... Yeah, it, it took yeah, four or five years. Several years before he was finally convicted and set. And because they had to the keep doing that all the time. So, but I don't, I don't see where anybody could could say, well, he hasn't been convicted yet, so we're going to consider him an honest, upstanding citizen. Oh. Bill, uh, the jury comes back. <laughs> what bothers me is, is how many votes is it. Is Robert Kennedy likely to siphon off well, from uh, Biden? Yeah. It'll be a few. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm worried about. Yeah, yeah. What, what disturbs me is that some Americans are willing to kill other Americans just because of their political views. <laughs> to me, that's you know, terribly un American yeah. based on our history. I remember as a kid, I was so impressed at a young age about people that were willing to make a sacrifice and lose their job, political career, whatever, to do what's right. Uh, in the civil rights movement, you have an uh, example? Yeah, Al Gore's uh, father from Tennessee, uh, when the Civil Rights Act was being voted on. Uh, 
he was told by a lot of the other senators, uh, if you vote for the Civil Rights Act, your career is done. You're cooked. He still voted for the Civil Rights Act. And true enough, he was his goose was cooked in the Tennessee Senate. Uh, well, election. that's Liz Blaney. <laughs> and Liz, yeah. Liz was absolutely clobbered. Now, what I would wish is that some of these Republicans, like, well, Liz, I know Liz is trying to do her best, but Romney and some of the other regular <clears throat> old-fashioned type Republicans band together and start making speeches. Yeah. Giving speeches all over the country. That West Virginia Senator has done that. <laughs> You know, but no labels party, but he won't run for it. He's made a lot of they're, they're resigning. They see no future. They yeah. see no such chance of success doing that, Linda. And so they're they're not fighting it. Buck just resigned. Uh, yes, yeah, not even finishing. Buck have a special Buck. election to finish its term. We've got just a couple minutes left. One thing I want to throw out too is on the firing line TV show. Uh, on PBS uh, just a couple nights ago, uh, there was an interview with folks uh, talking about the blueprint for Trump's second term. Oh, I read uh, that. Oh. And this is a, a document that conservatives have put together saying, uh, here's how we will get done what Trump wants to get done without opposition. And it is putting in his uh, supporters at the Justice Department, in the military, in all of the places that he found opposition last time that stopped him from doing things he wanted to, and that this is a blueprint for how to stop uh, the deep state opposition, they called it. Uh, very interesting and not getting a lot of publicity. Did you hear about that, Gene? Yes. Yeah, it's and so, just we saw. It's scary as all well, get out. So instead of having some departments that do have some modicum of independence, uh, this is the way to get them all to fall in line so uh, the plan will go without opposition. Ron, would you say Trump missed a big opportunity when all those 16 were going to resign? He should have said yes. <laughs> Good question. I don't know. Well, one of the things that in that report is that he would eliminate the Justice Department. <laughs> The independence of the Justice Department. Yes. The uh, yep. first kid I sponsored from the Philippines says, We are now heading to Ukraine, passing the Suez Canal. Whoa. Uh, Whoa. Gonna, they're going to pick up soybeans from Ukraine and deliver them to Iran. Uh, mm. Interesting. Okay. Okay. Last couple of comments. Deb. Oh, I, I, this is just so, um, the, the message I'm hearing is, you know, resigning versus standing up. And that's such a hard decision to make when you're standing so alone. And I mean, even in an organization, you know, and I'm working with government compliance in my job, and there's a lot of resistance to it from people who work within the organization. And so I'm really struggling with that. And even in the, our politics, like I think of our, the secret, you called her, Mitch McConnell's wife. Well, she was the Secretary of Transportation. No, she was in tra over transportation. Mm -hmm. And I and I worked for the DOT during the time that she was the head of that transportation. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, why isn't she saying something? Mm -hmm. Because her husband was yes, one the Secretary. It was the Republican, you know, and and she couldn't say anything, right? She was really that was a really good example of how much stress and um that that power and that intimidation and you know can destroy her husband's career her or her family everybody i mean it, it's just a really hard thing and how do you stand up to that level of power when you're just a solo person how do you do it that's well, the, the thing I, I i struggle with all the time and, and when you have unethical behavior in, in an organization or in a government or a church whatever it is yeah. how do you stand up and how do we stand up against this and what's it going to do for our grandchildren that's scary to me it's it really scary, scary. Yeah. Very scary. we're out of time thank okay. you ron for a great presentation. Okay.
Okay. Thank you, Zoomers, for being with us. We're going to see you. Thank you, Ron. Back. Bye. Bye bye. And uh, and the winner is the book. Yeah, let's see. Uh, Roger. Sue. Oh, yeah.